Hello everybody and welcome to this Straits Times Roundtable on Budget 2023 brought to you by UOB. I'm Vikram Khanna, I'm the Associate Editor of the Straits Times and I'll have the pleasure of moderating this panel. Uh, we have a very distinguished and diverse group of panelists with us. Let me introduce them briefly. To my left is Ong Pang Thai, uh, managing partner of KPMG and a council member of the Singapore Business Federation. On his left is Swan Tech King, uh, head of research at UOB. On his left is Annie Ko, emeritus professor of finance at SMU. And on her left is Patrick Tay, assistant secretary general of NTUC. Uh, welcome all of you and uh, let's talk about the budget. Okay, to start with, just uh, your, briefly, your reactions to the budget overall. Uh, what are its strong points, what will be its impact, but also what, if any, are its weak points, and is there anything missing that you would like to have seen in the budget? So, Pang Sai, would you like to start on that? Okay, um, yeah, sure, Vikram. Well, I think the uh, budget overall is a people's budget. Uh, and really, when I look at it, is it is no longer dealing with the uh, short-term issues. It has moved on to deal with more strategic issues, you know, restructuring of the Singapore economy, how we're going to position ourselves to be more competitive, what are the new ideas coming through in the next few years, and which are all the challenges that you know, we are you know, uh, anticipating. So, and I think uh, in that way, it's a great uh, budget and a way to look forward. Uh, one of the areas where I thought we could have, uh, or the budget could have dealt with more is uh, in the area of sustainability. Mm. I think this is an area where uh, hopefully it will be addressed uh, in the near future, where this is, you know, a point in time where uh, Singapore could take leadership uh, whether it is uh, green financing, whether it is uh, doing more for in terms of the built industry, uh, more initiatives being rolled out in that area. So uh, that's you know, really my wish list for perhaps next year and going forward. Right. Uh, and uh, take in, what do you think right. overall? For the budget, uh, uh, Vic, this is our first uh, post-pandemic uh, budget. Right, so we are moving away from the pandemic uh, uh, scenario and situation. And of course, uh, in this budget, uh, something for everybody, basically, uh, for the individuals and for the family uh, to manage our inflation pressures, the cost uh, pressures, and also for businesses as well, some of it. And I think the other uh, measures, those other measures that address a bit a more strategic, longer term uh, issues, topics, uh, for the family, for the new parents, in terms of the housing, the, our uh, population, aging population, and also the, in, in terms of uh, our new uh, population, you know, the baby bonus and all those things. So these are the things that are covered in there. And uh, I think I agree with Pang Tai just now about uh, sustainability, which was not mentioned so much in the, in the budget, right? especially for businesses. So I think agree that uh, this might be some, somewhere down the road in, in a future budgets. And then the other uh, topic that was not uh, mentioned also in terms of manpower uh, struggles with some of these companies that might be having with China uh, reopening, etc. And of course, the last thing is the GST for next year. I think it will be ongoing. There's no word of any, uh, any change. So I think the GST for next year will be ongoing. So these are some of these are measures, something for everybody, but also uh, address a longer term strategic uh, issue in terms of the family, our aging population, and also our low birth rate that hopefully uh, some of these um, measures can address as well in the future. Right, thank you. Right. Any overall reactions? Thank you. I actually love the theme, moving forward in a new era. Okay. So what do we mean by a new era? I think it's the post-COVID and post-pandemic. And I do agree with Bang Tai that actually it's strategic because we are looking beyond just this year's budget. 
Um, I do like the fact that it's very inclusive. There's an equitable portion to it, so it's progressive. It's looking very much after workers, and workers make a difference for the sustainability of organisations. So having career pathways, having a good job and quality jobs, I think those are very much uh, featured in this budget. I love it that we looked after working mums. I think working mums do need a lot of help and um, you know, having the CDAC top-ups for children. So encouraging you know, fertility increases. So those are great. Uh, agreed with Bang Tai that we actually didn't have too much of a stress on sustainability. I was you know, looking at the slides and trying to go to the annex and don't see very much of that feature. I do agree that the target is 2050 but we do need to put some things in place at a systems level across the different industry sectors in order to think green, think sustainable. But as far as ESG goes, the S has been given a lot of emphasis. Right. Thank you. Any, uh, Patrick, from your unionist point of view, what does the budget look like and what's missing? In fact, uh, in the run-up to this year's budget, I think uh, there were two topmost concerns amongst workers, unions and union leaders. They were actually cost of living and jobs. So I think uh, in this uh, budget, I think we have uh, positively uh, assisted in this as these two aspects. Actually, uh, as, as Prof Annie is sharing, moving forward the new era, I want to use the word era as an acronym uh, to describe this budget. E, equipping workers and of course enterprises. R, refreshing the new social compact, as well as ensuring a resilient workforce. Mm. At the same time, also A, giving some form of assurance yeah, to workers in general, to Singaporeans in general, through the various assistance and support packages. Uh, however, I think, uh, you know, uh, if we say some of the areas that were not picked up, I would say one area which uh, I personally, together with the labour movement, have been lobbying for, uh, through the NTUC SNAF PME Task Force, we came up with a deck of recommendations and uh, one of it was to provide some form of transitionary, trans transitionary unemployment support uh, for those uh, that may be laid off. Uh, and and, and uh, we, we hope there's some form of support for these workers uh, who are in the midst of looking for jobs and in the midst of re-entering the workforce. I thought this part uh, was uh, not addressed and I look forward uh, to hear more. Uh, well, there's a Forward Singapore conversation uh, in progress. So we hope to hear more of it uh, then. Okay, we'll pick up on some of those themes uh, later on in our conversation. Huh? Mm -hmm. But first, just you know, let's let's look at the external environment. I think he, the DPM, uh, made reference to the fact that it's become less growth friendly. We have deglobalization. We have trade tensions. We have anti-inflationary policies. So how should Singapore adjust its economic strategy? to deal with these challenges, which may last a while. I mean, it's not, it's not a one or two year thing. It's, it couldn't go on for years. So how do we adjust, adjust our strategy to deal with these headwinds going forward? Any thoughts, uh, anybody? I, I don't want to buttonhole a particular panelist, but so what do you think, Annie? Okay, I'll start. Um, I think the adjustment in the strategy is focus on good workers. Right, so I think the human capital element piece was a very strategic slant. Um, if you do have you know, dedicated, motivated employees and you invest in them, that will make a difference because it will result in our competitive advantage. And it will bring more companies because tech and talent comes hand in hand. So I do see that as a very positive direction. Now, when I was in Davos, um, one of the biggest concerns of the WTO is friend shoring. <laughs> that means if you're not my friend, mm -hmm. I will not put my FDIs in your place. So, you know, DPM spoke about onshoring, offshoring, but the friend shoring piece is where the political tensions are creating a lot of uneasiness. And I think uh, WTO's Dr. Nozi actually said, we have many underdeveloped and developing world. So if you go by friend shoring, please consider us a friend as well. I think the positioning of Singapore amongst ASEAN 
is a very good strategic positioning as well. And so encouraging our SMEs, our promising local enterprises to go international is also a very good strategic move. So building people, building it in terms of collaboration, looking at offshoring, but amongst ASEAN as a united community. I think that can be a very powerful strategic comparative advantage for the country. Right. Any further thoughts? Jump in sure. Uh, I agree with uh, Annie uh, on that particular point. But one of the most <coughs> important consideration or the strengths that Singapore possess is really uh, credibility, mm. trust, respect for contractual arrangement, mm. and the rule of law. And we have a, a great talent pool. Mm. And it's also the attractiveness uh, of Singapore as a location where you know, we could attract people. So <clears throat> in my view, we need to play up uh, those strengths. And this has played out uh, during the pandemic, mm -hmm. where Singapore has done you know, all the right things. So in terms of credibility, mm -hmm. I think uh, it is something that uh, will be very attractive to international players. And given you know, in terms of our you know, principle-based way of thinking, not taking sides, uh, doing the right thing, what's best you know, for the country and for, you know, as a good global citizen. Uh, if you start looking at uh, what's happening within the geopolitical arena, uh, in fact, given all those strengths that we possess, Singapore is really a logical location for a plus one, mm. whether for the West or for you know, the East China. And this is where I think we should capitalize uh, in terms of that opportunity, because it's creating an opportunity uh, that has presented itself uh, even stronger today than three years ago. And in this regard, in our businesses, we are seeing a lot more. The regional C-suites uh, are located in Singapore, and that's the cell that I've been uh, doing for my, or within my global organization to get you know, our colleagues you know, to focus more on Singapore, spend time here because you know, the businesses are being attracted here, the decision makers are here. So it is natural place where you know, we could create new opportunities right, right. and new types of work. Right. So these are per perennial strengths that will, even in good times or in bad times, these are permanent strengths that Singapore has, especially in bad times. So even more you so, make a very important point. Yes, even more so during bad times yeah. because it's showing up how important it is. Right. You right. know, more important than anything else. Yeah. I just, want, yeah, yeah. I just want to add on to uh, what Pang Tai just said and also Annie just say in this uh, new uh, political, new job political environment, yeah. right? And, you know, in Singapore, try for many decades yeah. with the globalization. You know, we have free trade. Uh, yeah. Basically, the you can get our things, you know, produced at the lowest cost possible. You can get from there. But the not new political environment, the new job political environment, with reshoring and on uh, French shoring as well. So it presents uh, both uh, challenges and opportunities. Mm. Now the challenges is that the cost of things will not be as low as what we used to, right. used to, used to get. Right? Because at the time you have the globalization, the uh, you know, efficiency, the low, lowest efficiency, uh, the best efficiency. But now we have to consider resiliency as well. Right? And not just efficiency, but resiliency. Mm. So this means that the costs are going to be higher in f going forward. So these are challenges that we need to manage because the cost, higher cost also mean for Singapore inflation, right? Cost of our materials and food right. and all that, and also security. Okay. Of course, uh, opportunity, like what Pang Tai said, and also uh, Prof also mentioned that, you know, Singapore is a very uh, good position to capitalize on this, you know, because of our uh, friend to everybody right. <laughs> position, the trust that we have the people have in the government and also investors have in the, in the Singapore government. The way that we manage the pandemic during the past few years, I think it shows a lot of, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, strength and flexibility and also the rule of law, etc. and all those things that come in. The investors value those continuity, certainty and predictability of Singapore government policy. And that's very important for foreign investors. So all these um, 
French shoring or uh, deglobalization move or regionalization. We talk about regionalization, and Singapore stands in a very good place that we need to capitalize on this uh, flow. And our organization is the same thing, right? We plug into ASEAN, mm. and that's where we see a lot of flows coming to ASEAN for the French shoring a bit of the business, right. right? In terms of trade flows and shifting from China to let's say, for example, to ASEAN and then to other parts of the world. And that's a very important uh, development that's taking place. And we are in a very good position that we, to capitalize, for Singapore to capitalize, and our companies as well, to take advantage, to capitalize on these uh, flows. Yeah. Right. Declan, you, you talked a lot about cost, for example. So I think this is an important point that DPM made, which is that, OK, we have inflation. Mm -hmm. We we'll probably have a more inflationary decade Mm -hmm. the 2020s than we had in the previous decade. And he said that we can't rely on government support year after year to deal right. with inflationary pressures. Mm -hmm. So we've got to somehow sort of manage without government support mm -hmm. and manage to beat the impact of inflation. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? Any thoughts on that? I mean, how, how do we, we're dealing with an inflationary decade, how do we, if government can't give us support every yes, year, definitely. what can we do? I think that's where, you know, as you want to be a very, very competitive country, mm. yeah. we need competitive businesses. Mm -hmm. right? So uh, it drills down to having a very competitive workforce. Yes. And uh, not just a workforce that's competitive, but uh, where we have high skilled talents. Yes. I think that's one of the winning moves that we have uh, or we, we embark on. Mm -hmm. And therefore you see this budget, not just a pro-business budget, also a very poor worker budget mm. to make sure that uh, our workforce is constantly mm. reskilled, upskilled, multi-skilled mm -hmm. to keep pace with many of the disruption, uh, the changes and the challenges. I mean, we talked about the various challenges uh, well in the region as well as globally. Right. And therefore, there's a big drive. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's not just Singapore. I think around the world and all the different countries, you know, when I interact with many of mm. the unions across the globe and a lot of the tripartite partners across mm. the globe, uh, you know, the, the workforce training and upgrading and skills acquisition piece is of utmost importance, particularly so with the shortening of the half-life of skills mm -hmm. and, and the need to really be on that treadmill journey uh, to pick up in-demand skills, which actually are, is constantly morphing, transforming, and, and, and that's one big challenge. And it, well, actually, two other challenges uh, are exacting in Singapore. Mm -hmm. We have an uh, aging population and aging workforce. At the same time, we are burning the candles at both ends. Mm -hmm. We have a lower fertility rate. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's why we have a series of measures. Uh, but really, we have a very, very tight labour market, a very, very, uh, well, in a way, shrinking workforce, mm -hmm. uh, active workforce. And that, that exacts quite a bit of challenges, So, which also means Every worker matters. Mm, yes. Yeah. Every single worker matters, uh, and that's why we have uh, in this budget we see some of the measures mm. to really support older, as well as uh, even uh, new areas of workers. For example, the disabled workers, as well right. as uh, ex-offenders. So I think there's a big drive to make sure everyone counts and every worker matters. Right. 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 Actually, that question on inflation, Vikram, I think is a very good right, question because I think companies are also doing some things about it. So I think the response to inflation is we've gone through inflation before, but those early years of inflation... You're talking about the excess, 70s? Yes, Okay. correct. So I, I don't want to talk about when, uh, huh? then you can date <laughs> our ages. But you know, if you look at those times, it was a very different world. Yeah. So we have lived with the inflation then, but we had excess capacity. So that's the supply mm -hmm. side. And therefore we could actually still surmount because we could have lower wages, you know, when inflation is too high, then you get recession and then wages come down. Today's world has very different generations of workers. So we have to also think about how to collaborate. And I think many companies are thinking out of the boxes these days. So we could have actually tech talent hubs outside of Singapore. We have the Batam Singapore arrangement as well, you know? Yeah. And I know big companies don't see that as, you know, meeting all their needs because they could still recruit from outside the country and pay higher wages. Yeah. But for many startups, for many SMEs, they can think creatively. They could have actually some workers that is from Indonesia, move them to Batam 
look after their housing and one day a week they could take the ferry and come to Singapore and it's more for bonding with the staff. So remote working, hybrid working would allow for us to bring the total cost of employment down mm. if you think creatively. And it also gives our workers the opportunity to work cross-culturally with different talent from different parts of Southeast Asia. Right, right. And at the same yeah. time, uh, ensuring those jobs in Singapore continue to remain good quality jobs mm. and uh, good paying jobs. I think that's... Okay. Uh, I, I want to come back to the whole jobs issue, but would Vaktai Tekin have anything to add on inflation? Sure, I just want inflation? to add on to uh, what Prof and uh, Pat said about, you know, in terms of the workers, that's a very important bit. We need to make sure good jobs are here, yeah. are good pay, and then how, how do we um, leverage on uh, resources from outside Singapore as well. Right. But the other important bit is also, a, it was addressed at yesterday's uh, budget, was for companies in terms of the innovation piece, mm. yeah. right? The innovation and Prof talk about creativity and innovation, that's a very important part as well to overcome in terms of cost, right? Well, a cost, one thing, but of the other bit is the value that we create from this higher cost. So if we can create higher value to innovation by companies, and that would, you know, that would, will be on, uh, on the winning side already because we create better value, higher value compared to the cost. So the innovation bit, the yesterday, uh, the finance, uh, finance minister, uh, Mr. Lawrence Wong, announced on the enterprise innovation scheme. So that's one example to encourage uh, companies to, in terms of the innovation uh, space, how the government can also help in that. And uh, Mr. Wong also cited one example of this uh, mooring company. Right now is a world number three, yeah. something, you know, yeah. world number three. And yeah. from a tiny little red dot, yeah. it could be at the forefront of a technology as well, right. based on our innovation. Also, that's very encouraging right, right. Uh, bit. That's, that's such an important point because our workforce growth is going to be very low or, mm -hmm. or maybe even zero. Right. And so we have to depend almost entirely on productivity for our GDP growth. Yes. Mm. So all these things, the enterprise financing scheme that you mentioned, the innovation initiatives, mm -hmm. absolutely critical. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Even when we talk about training and upgrading, I mean, bottom line is about productivity. Correct. Ensuring that uh, you know every worker maximizes his or her yeah. full potential. Right. And uh, leveraging on technology, uh, automation, mechanization, and now artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things. Yeah. So I think very, Scary very important stuff. to yes. leverage on the whole ecosystem to maximize our productivity so that uh, from a, a trade unionist perspective, uh, we don't just have good jobs, we have good paying jobs uh, to cope with uh, rising uh, cost of living and inflation at the same time. Yeah. And that right. attracts our young people as well. So some industries that may look like sunset industry, mm. marine, you know, mm. if you get automation in, if you bring in the sustainability theme, mm. actually many young people will say it's not sunset. Oh. All right, we'll love to do coastal vessels electrification. Yeah. Mm. And one of my alumni is doing exactly that, transforming his family-owned business right. through electrification of coastal vessels. Right. Mm. And that can be exported. It's a technology. So sure. we have many islands in Indonesia. We'll love to collaborate sure, with sure. them. Oh, yo, that's an important point. The <coughs> Somebody once said that there's no such thing as a sunset industry. They're only sunset companies. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I mean, they're yeah. Yeah. companies if doing don't very well respond. in very old industries. Don't reno yep. innovate. It's, yeah. yeah, innovation is spreads across industries, not whether there's no sunrise, sunset. It's only companies yeah. Uh, yeah, that matter. Absolutely. But, okay, C can we come back to the issue of workers? Um, DPM um, talked about training. Uh, and there's a new initiative on training whereby there will be intermediaries who are brought in to match workers to jobs. Mm -hmm. Job mismatching is still a problem. Mm -hmm. There's still a lot of vacancies. Uh, just can we understand what is wrong with the existing training system? Why didn't it deliver good employment outcomes? I think there are already a lot of programs and initiatives they let the outcomes, but I think this uh, latest announcement is uh, further adds on and builds on the, the, the successes that we have seen in the past couple of years with industry transformation, as well as the man, many skills future related uh, programs and, and support. But I think, I think the, the key challenge actually for Singapore, 
uh, minor cyclical unemployment will be structural unemployment in, in terms of skills mismatch. Today, as we are talking, there are more than 120,000 jobs out there. Mm -hmm. uh, our unemployment rate relatively low. Mm -hmm. uh, overall unemployment rate about 2%. Yep. Citizenry unemployment rate about 3%. So actually, we are, we are fairly uh, uh, bounced back uh, to pre-COVID days. But I think the challenge is um, wh whether we can get people into uh, you know, those jobs they are, they are grow they're growing or, or being transformed uh, in, uh, into new jobs. Uh, so I think this connection uh, bit uh, will be very, very important and vital as we move ahead and cope or overcome structural unemployment. That's why uh, beyond the existing tripartite partners and existing agencies that are supporting this space, including the labour movement, uh, we, we, uh, you heard from uh, DPM Lawrence Wong about labour market intermediaries to further enhance and to, to have a multi-stakeholder approach yeah, you know, even our institutes of higher learning and, and various industry and trade associations can also, even private sector partners can also play a big role in, uh, in, in strengthening this nexus between picking up the skills and the people who are looking out for jobs or looking out for bigger jobs to be connected and uh, can find that better match. Uh, not easy. Today, as we are talking, it's, it's, never, it's quite difficult to find a perfect match, but if we can achieve more or less about there, about right, uh, we can fill those gaps and, and, and uh, with training, skills upgrading, and even uh, minimise that expectation and skills mismatch. Yeah. I think, I think you're, sure, I'll back you a minute. Pantan, you had mentioned... Maybe, maybe Pantan jump in okay. first and then I... Okay, write. yeah, no, Pankrai, please. Vikram, I <coughs> agree with Patrick's point about the uh, structural unemployment. Mm -hmm. And that happens through either passage of time or by choice. Mm -hmm. So, and that, that's the, the, the great thing about Singapore, all people have a lot of choice. Uh, but I think as an employer and uh, many of the members of SBF, uh, we are encountering in terms of, you know, one of the feedback is really on, you know, not having enough talent. And this is a challenge. Where do we find the workers? And, uh, and when we read the, uh, the announcement by DPM yesterday, uh, you know, we probably need to look at more details, you know, what's coming through, uh, the uh, job skills, um, you know, matching, you know, uh, or integrators. Uh, it's really moving from being a blunt policy tool to something more targeted, the way I see it. Okay. So in the past was, you know, go and do, you know, this is a sum of money, mm -hmm. go and upgrade yourself. Okay. But, you know, after acquiring those skills, you may not, you know, find a suitable job. Right. <coughs> but this is the one where, you know, the training, the skills that you are trained on is suited for something that an employer is looking for. And I think that's quite interesting. The second part that I thought is very useful in terms of, uh, you know, the uh, announcement was really uh, we are short of human capital as mm -hmm. a country. And I think uh, the policy makers have been quite clear. You know, land, people, those are constraints. Let's work within the constraints. And how, to, how do we deal with that? Bringing people with disabilities, bringing the ex-offenders, it is another way mm -hmm. of getting them onto the uh, workforce. You know, how do we then like Patrick said, everyone counts, every worker counts. Mm. Uh, but the third group that I'd like to go to is the gig workers, the platform workers. Mm. Yes, uh, <clears throat> this is a group where I think it's right for all of us to tap because they do that work sometimes by choice. But we need them to do something that's uh, probably uh, you know, more than what they're doing today. I'm not suggesting it's not important, they're important. But we need them in other areas of our economic sectors. We need them to be part of that workforce so that we become more competitive, we are better, we have you know, a future you know, to work through. So I, I, I'm going to stop there. Uh, yeah. so can Annie, I you, had a, yes. you, had, you had talked earlier about having run a project, a pilot project, yes. uh, right. where you have a different type of training yes. and which worked out quite well. So Correct. could you explain how that works? Very good. So I was very excited uh, when DPM actually announced this job skills integrators. Right. So you, if you note, the word is not job skills matching. 
Mm. So it's a, not a matchmaker, it's an integrator. And an integrator means that you really need to bring in a lot more collaborative partners. So during the COVID years, all right, many of our PMETs actually lost their jobs, even before then. And we actually pitched to three ministries. So you see, we got the task force for COVID fighting. This is like three ministries are needed to get quality training and good job integration so that you actually don't just do the training, but the training is matched to the needs of companies. Mm -hmm. So we have SSG helping us with fee subsidies because that sits under MOE and I'm with the university. Sorry, what is SSG? SSG, Skills uh, Ah. Skills Future Singapore. Skills Future. Future. Okay, yeah. yeah. Then we have WSG, which is work for Singapore, Singapore. Singapore. And WSG sits under MOM. So other than getting the skills subsidies, mm -hmm. training subsidies, we also got wage subsidies. Uh. We tell the prospective employers, can you please take this person? Because based on your needs to us, we found that this person has the best competencies but we won't force it on you we'll give you three out of the pool to do the interview so we are really doing a bit of this job matching role can you imagine my whole team in the university uh, that i was doing the pilot with all right they were working towards looking at the profile of candidates and matching to the needs of the company right and then on top of that we actually went for one sector so that was what Pantai says. We went for wholesale trade sector because I run an international trading institute within the university. And the wholesale trade sector is very broad. We can actually have upstream B2B wholesale trade and then downstream logistics, warehousing, trade facilitation, procurement, the whole works. So there are a variety of job roles okay. and that's the systems approach. So I can actually tell you this works, mm. but it can't be done on big scale. So maybe with the GSI coming in, maybe with many of the uh, possible sectors mm. all coming in, including precision engineering, retail and wholesale, we might be able to cast the net wider and go beyond just this pilot. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And also to ensure that we have um, outcomes after training and skills upgrading, something we can we talk about. I think uh, besides all these pilots and this accelerator program, the labour movement has uh, been on this journey to form company training committees. Mm. So not just those that are outside or looking for jobs uh, in new and growth sectors, at the same time also those already in the companies, we are also concerned about them to ensure that they stay employed and employable. Uh, that's why we are on this big drive towards forming company training committees of which quite a number of our, our, uh, our large local enterprises, including multinationals, are on board already, including SMEs. Yeah, so uh, I think it's important to, to also continue to upskill the workforce because we are seeing a lot of uh, embracing of uh, digitalization, transformation, mechanization, including many of the advanced technologies, including in manufacturing. Right. Yeah, I was visiting a few of our multinational um, manufacturing facilities in Singapore in the past couple of months. And I must say, uh, we really have state-of-the-art facilities uh, with a lot of support uh, uh, from EDB uh, as well as the government. And I, I, I see a lot of opportunities uh, for workers in general to really continue to build up those skills and to ensure that we have a competitive workforce and be able to compete uh, with the giants across the globe. Right, right. Workplace learning is very critical, Mikram. Absolutely. So, you know, it's not just about you know, attending classes. Yeah. yeah, it's taking that knowledge and then transforming it into something that's relevant and impactful for the company that is sponsoring you. Right, right. So if you can add value, mm. you have created a niche for yourself right. and the company will say, can I employ you? Right. Because you've known what we need and you've actually come up with a project that you could work on. Right. No, but I just want to ask, despite all these best efforts, there will still be workers, or there may still be workers, who, despite training uh, and so on, are not able to fill the roles, that the new jobs that are being created. Right? Yeah. The new jobs that are being created may be in areas of automation, maybe the company has sort of you know, uh, put in new technology and so on. 
and the worker we're talking about is maybe 60 years old, he's been laid off, he has a primary school education. Mm. He can't fit easily into any of these new roles. Mm. So there will be, in short, there will be workers who fall between the cracks, yeah. despite all these best efforts. Mm. So what do we do about these workers? Yeah. I mean, that's why the, the labour movement has been on this journey, as we talked about the company training committees. Yeah. Uh, we wanted to really drill down to those workers who are more vulnerable, yeah. particularly the matured workers, um, especially in, in companies and businesses where they have started to transform, yeah. introduce a lot of new technology, introduce a lot of new machinery, introduce a lot of new robotics. Uh, there's a, really a need for them to pick up those skills. Not easy, and not easy. Uh, I, I've seen some of them, we have facilitated some of the training through our unions and union leaders, and a lot of convincing, a lot of mindset change needs to be, to be done. So not easy to shift mental models, but uh, it's a journey. I think it's going to be a treadmill journey. Mm. Because uh, with an ageing workforce, we yeah. really constantly have to be at it. Well, there's an ecosystem. You've heard yesterday's announcements. Special employment credit extended to 25, 2025. And many of the, the grants, including the part-time and the re-employment grants, they are helping and nudging employers to, to, to give the older workers an, uh, another chance, another opportunity, and to, to, to provide a lot of government subvention so that to ease that, that whole process of uh, not giving up on, every, uh, uh, on even the older workers, uh, not giving up on also the, those that are maybe fall through the cracks, uh, but you know, give them an opportunity and in partnership with the labour movement. That's where uh, quite a number of our union leaders have been busy at it. Uh, in fact, this January, mm. uh, just last month, uh, there was actually one company which was going in, uh, in manufacturing, yeah, in the electronics and electrical space, facing some challenges with a slowdown in global demand. Mm. So there's a bit of like a shorter work week. So what we have done is we have sent a group of um, uh, about 80 workers mm. for workplace uh, literacy mm. and uh, uh, IT skills training. So uh, in the downtime, while demand is relatively a bit softer, uh, time is not wasted, there's absentee payroll, there's training mm -hmm. uh, grants. So actually, in fact, it's almost zero cost to the company. Okay. And uh, it's a win-win-win outcome. Mm. Yeah, uh, company not having to lay off workers, uh, saving those jobs. At the same time, also workers picking up some new skills mm. and uh, being more confident. It wasn't easy. We, uh, we spoke to some of the workers. They say, yeah. wow, uh, not so easy. Eh? Some of these uh, skills, future le NTC learning hub causes is quite yeah. challenging. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but uh, they found that it was quite edifying. And at the end of the day, they still keep their jobs. So I thought these various interventions are very, very crucial right, right. to ensure we not just cut costs to save uh, uh, jobs. Yeah, we, we do, because we don't want yeah. Companies who you know, uh, cut jobs to save costs. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Any well, other thoughts? Well, <coughs> from my perspective, is increasingly, you know, especially uh, the younger generation, they're going to have a dozen jobs in their lifetime. Wow. The question is whether within the same organization, same sector, or across different organization or different sectors. So, the point about unlearning and relearning is key, and how do we embed that, mm. you know, within the mindset of our people? And uh, if you start thinking about you know, new technology, it is about you know, unlearning what you have done in the past. How do you embrace something new? I know it's frightening, it's scary sometimes. Uh, but when you start doing it, it's not so bad after, after all. But trying to train your muscles on it as early as possible. Yeah. You know, do a lot of job redesign along the way, because that's going to happen within our industries all over. Because as automation becomes, you know, uh, more and more uh, what you call prevalent or being used more. But the other point is also, and I know there are certain sectors within the service industry, they are in need of people, you know, yet they cannot hire. And if you think about you know, some of the hotels, they, are not, you know, they don't open all the rooms because there's just not enough people. How do we encourage you know, workers to move from a different sector into another sector, which is quite different, but something that they will be able to deal with or to handle jobs. So I think that's important because that's also uh, you know, about choices, about how do we make sure that we fully leverage on our human capital within the country. Right, right. So, Jekyll, you know, I think he, he mentioned the point about the hotel sector, yeah. for example. I think the ec economic, economic findings are that the service sector generally has very low productivity. <laughs> 
uh, apart from financial services, your industry is <laughs> doing well. <laughs> Infocom is doing all right. <laughs> but you know, you have things like the hospitality industry, mm -hmm. the retail uh, business, very low productivity, yeah. whereas manufacturing is doing all right. So what is the problem with productivity in the service? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is a very tough question to answer. Yes, I you know will. We look at you. <laughs> <laughs> right, I mean, this uh, productivity, especially for services industry, one thing is very difficult to measure. Yeah. Right. There's one difficulty is difficult to measure the productivity. Um, it's unlike manufacturing, where you can actually count the physical products that you can uh, generate. Whereas uh, in services industry, is uh, very difficult uh, to to do that. Right, so that's one uh, difficulty. And the other um, difficulty, of course, is um, I think um, the, uh, there's um, a lot of manual process mm. as well yeah. that cannot be easily automated. For example, in the construction industry, mm. there's a lot of efforts trying to reduce uh, in terms of labor or improve productivity. It's very difficult, very challenging because a lot of manual process are being involved in, in those. So I think, uh, in, again, I think uh, let's not give up you know, we continue to push on this journey in terms of a skill upgrade, very important. I think Pat and you know, Prof talk about the skill upgrade, the multi-skill, the rescale, because that is one pathway to increase uh, productivity, right? How to incorporate new technologies and innovations for company as well to innovate in, in order to improve their productivity mm -hmm. as well. So these are difficult uh, challenges, very difficult challenges, but we do have to push on uh, in this journey. No easy answer to that. Yeah. So Vikram, I think we concentrate a lot on the workers. I also want to talk about managers. Okay. I think mindset change, you know, if you give a worker some ownership, mm. <laughs> if you look at some of the F&B outlets, Haiti Lao, Right, okay. and some of the much better, uh, well operated restaurants, mm -hmm. you would notice that there's a pride in the work. Mm. And if the workers are given that empowerment, that pride, mm. if we are managers who actually trust the workers, okay, I think it's a win win. So you could retain, no point getting recruitment and not being able to retain. Mm. So that mindset shift giving them the enhancements. We are now seeing a lot of robots, but there are still certain mm. things that the workers are needed. Mm. So the robotic help is great. It allows you to feel that, okay, you don't have to do all this manual task. Yep. The inspiration to work. Hey, actually, hospitality and f mm. would have attracted a lot of young people. Mm. It's an experiential thing. So give them that delight in coming to work and that delight comes from the culture of the organization beyond just competencies and skills. Right. Bangta, yes. I'll build on that point, uh, Vikram. Uh, if you think about you know, the way that we have implemented how we digitize as an organization, um, and many of that, you know, when I observe as a customer uh, in F&B outlets, they do have you know, the QR code you know, for you to uh, place your orders, but it stops there. Yeah. You know, what about the payment uh, leg? Yeah. You know, we, can, we can bypass you know, the need for you to you know, have that human interaction uh, because how, how you place you the orders. Oh. You oh. place the orders, after that you make payment. Okay. But you know, today, if you use that example, I can use that to place an order. I have to you know, get someone, yeah. a cashier, Go to the know, counter. Or go to the counter to make payment <laughs> okay. using my credit card. Oh, cash. Yeah. Mm. I see. So the other example is, uh, I think we did very well during pandemic, you know, in terms of cashless. But I'm seeing, you know, in some of the uh, hawker centers, for example, they are reverting, going back to cash. Yeah. You know, and I think we just need to make sure that, you know, we don't regress. Old habits think, die hard, eh? <laughs> <laughs> For whatever reason, because that was so convenient. Yeah, the touch of money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All real. <laughs> the digital. I won't go into the uh, Yeah, the yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Fantastic. So, okay, uh, we are coming close to the, to the end of our conversation. Mm. Um, so I want, to, I want us to focus uh, a little on some of the tougher questions. Okay, now, one is that we now have had three fiscal deficits in a row with this latest budget, right? And the government is supposed to balance its books over the course of its term 
which ends in 2025. So I guess, at least on paper, it faces some pretty tough choices ahead. There will be pressure on revenue. Uh, so how can the government deal with this? Related to this is the, this, the paper put out by the uh, Ministry of Finance recently saying that because of the, the less favorable external environment, pressures on spending on health, especially infrastructure, social supports, which will be keep mounting over this decade. I mean, uh, we're going to be in a much tighter fiscal position going forward. So I think we need to also think first about what maybe what new taxes uh, can be introduced or increased maybe. And also, uh, unfortunately, uh, what expenditures, if any, can be cut. So just to think about those difficult questions, which I think the government will have to face mm -hmm. uh, at some, maybe in the next budget, but certainly over the course of the decade. Mm. What are your thoughts on what it can do? Mm. So taking you're the, you're the <laughs> resident economist here. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Uh, we you are right, uh, very difficult choices faced by the government uh, because we have an aging society. That means in terms of the income tax revenue, uh, perhaps also corporate tax uh, revenue as well may be affected. Uh, but at the same time, expenditure would have to go up, you know, especially for the, for, to cater to the aging population. Right. So very difficult choices. Uh, over the uh, course of the next uh, two years or so, I am a bit more po uh, optimistic on that. Mm as long as we don't get into any kind of uh, crisis or any sort of that thing, assuming that things go normally, yes. I think our revenue should be able to come in to, to ensure to have a balanced uh, budget uh, over the course of the five years. So over the past three budget is about, I think, 11 billion or maybe less of uh, deficit that accumulated. Mm -hmm. So I think that is not insurmountable. That's not insurmountable, especially if you look at last year. Mm -hmm. In terms of revenue came in much stronger than expected. Yep. So hopefully we are going to get that same uh, positive surprise as well on the revenue side, as long as we don't get into any kind of a crisis or any, any sort of a deep recession. Right? Okay. So far, we don't see that. But um, I think for the longer term, mm -hmm. in terms, I think the structural issue, we need to be uh, a bit more um, uh, close, pay close attention to that. The demand for expenditure will be higher and you have uh, the other question that we have not addressed so far, the minimum corporate tax, mm. that global corporate tax that we have to, may have to implement yes. in 2025, that mm. how would that impact our corporate tax revenue right, going beyond 2025? Mm. Is it going to be more or less? Right? The chances are the best that we can hope for is going to be a neutral impact on that. But you know that the pressure for expenditure going up and then the tax revenue may be under pressure to come down. So we cannot rule out also beyond the 2025, what other tax revenue sources that we may have to look into to raise uh, more tax revenue. Maybe the GST rate may have to go up to, you know, further for Double that. Digits. <laughs> <laughs> GST and uh, asset, other asset taxes, right. estate taxes, inheritance taxes, and all those things we, <coughs> we cannot rule out. Those are possibilities. Sorry, just, just, to, just to interrupt you here, sorry. You know, since you're mentioning GST, one of the anomalies of our GST is the threshold. Mm -hmm. We have a threshold of $1 million mm -hmm. before GST becomes applicable. Mm -hmm. That must be one of the highest in the world. Australia mm -hmm. is 75,000 Australian dollars. Mm -hmm. That's when GST becomes. Right. UK is, I think, 85,000 mm -hmm. pounds. We have $1 million. Right. Mm -hmm. There are some countries, I think, like Korea, mm -hmm. have no threshold at all. Every business mm -hmm. is must pay. Has must pay GST. Yeah. So, I mean, could we not, with, without having to raise the rate of GST, mm -hmm. double digits, could we not just lower the threshold? Wouldn't that be, I mean, do it gradually, do it a little bit at a time. Yeah. But aren't we like way out uh, compared to uh, others? What do you There's think? I mean, one, I maybe Pang Tai can answer this uh, question. Yeah, sorry, you're <laughs> not only, uh, yeah. That's what yeah. the text. Right? One, one possibility to lower it, but again, I just, but before I leave it to Pang Tai, is uh, in terms of collection as well. So you have to consider the collection yeah. uh, part of it. You compliance, know, let's say compliance every cost. business. Yeah, yes. compliance cost. Compliance cost, right? But that's let's a one-time thing. I mean, he, yeah. once he learns how to comply, he's, comp <laughs> he's, he's learned. 
Right. So, yeah. Okay. Pang Tai, yeah. So, <coughs> uh, Vikram, the, the few considerations, I think the first point is that threshold is one million, but companies do have option to register, mm. you know, mm. if you want to register, yeah, you know, even, you know, when you're half a million, for example. But the other consideration, and I think the Singapore system is a good one because you do have a choice, mm. but it's going to be very hard for SMEs mm. yep. if they are unable to pass the uh, GST to their customers. But how come other countries, they do it? Yes. Wh what is so unique about us? Yeah. Ah. You, you will have to build your customer, yeah. you know, that, that yeah. 2%. Yeah, yeah. But if your customer do not have uh, appetite, you know, to pay, you know, the businesses will have to absorb yeah. okay. that GST. Have choice. So you have no choice. Mm -hmm. So, and then add on the compliance cost, the implementation cost, uh, mm -hmm. that's going to be harder, you know, for our SMEs. So I think we are, I would say, in a better position, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and friendlier to our businesses mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, that helped, you know, them to go about and at the same time, you know, keep the cost down, okay. bring the inflation, you know, <laughs> lower okay. than what it would have been in other countries. Yeah. All right. So the budget is actually a, a sum of a lot of moving parts. Yeah. And if you, I, I was quite fortunate to have, take a look at Annex A2, okay. right, the fiscal position in uh, FY 2023. So just now, um, you know, Tegin was saying, last year we were estimating an 11 billion deficit. Mm. But we came in, all right, after, you know, all the revenues have been collected and all the expenditure made at only minus 4.22. So in essence, if everything, all the moving parts, and that is without the capitalization, is minus 2.04 at the end. So from a minus 11 expected to become minus 2. So we actually could make all right, more than what was anticipated. And that is why if we do it right strategically, then hopefully this year's small deficit could turn into a surplus. Mm. They say the government is always conservative. In no. <laughs> <laughs> there were years like COVID years when we were hoping for a smaller deficit, right. but then four rapid budgets needed when Min Hin was, uh, you know, Minister of Finance, and we have to keep using. Yeah. yeah? So the, the world is not very predictable. <laughs> yeah. But holding everything constant. At this point in time, yeah. the three big drivers that's helping to cover the expenditure that we all saw yesterday right. comes from income tax, comes from corporate tax, right. comes from GST. Yep. Right. That 1% increase, if it all comes even at that 1 million threshold, yeah. would have helped the budget in terms of our revenue. Right. Right. Now, Lowering the threshold, I agree with Pang Tai, that affects SMEs and the compliance cost will make it like so onerous that even the SMEs will say that this is not something that I can pass to my customer. Yeah. So, you know, you will kill them. Right. So for Singapore, I think a large part of the GST is also spent by people coming in. Yeah. We are a service industry, so they cannot claim for goods bought. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, we are actually having people coming here, having the good experience of, you know, staying in Singapore mm. and contributing to it and not begrudging us because they have had that good experience and the affordability to pay for it. Right, right. So I think all in, um, it's equitable and we are actually helping the lower 30% of our people. Right, right. So the budget down the road hopefully will turn surplus and then we can bring it back into our reserves. Right. Mm. On the, uh, on also on the optimistic side, um, if the progressive wage model works out well, that means you have several industries where mm. low wage workers have higher wages, that, is, that improves your tax base, you know? Yes. Yeah. Right. Especially on GST, yeah. because all of them will have more to spend, yeah. all of them will be spending yeah. more yeah. on GST. Absolutely. Mm. And yeah. I think there could be an upside surprise yeah in GST collections, mm -hmm. if, this is an if, huh? progressive wage model must work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It must be sustainable. Yeah. Uh, so, how, how is it working out so far in the sectors we have yeah. already imposed it? Yes, yes. Uh, so we are, we, are very, we are optimistic. Yes. I think uh, we started off with three sectors almost a decade ago. Yeah. Right. Uh, that's work in progress and I think we have set some milestones and timelines. So that's on, on target. New sectors, 
For example, like lift and escalator technicians mm -hmm. uh, come in a couple of years' time by 2028. Their wages will be like something like 3,001 to 4,001. Mm -hmm. So, so more, uh, more progressive wages. And, and, and of course, new sectors we're looking at, uh, possibly even in the services sector, retail F&B. I think uh, even administration, uh, we'll be looking at these various sectors where we can uh, really you know, uplift uh, the, 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 those who are, who are below the line in terms of the bottom 30% and how we can ensure that not just raise wages, uh, but of course raise their productivity mm -hmm. through skills training, uplifting their skills and, and qualifications. Uh, at the same time, also providing more career opportunities to move up the career ladder. I think that's very, very important. I think and we have started to move beyond those sectors. I think besides progressive wage sectors, uh, now increasingly there's a, there's a, I think there's a, particularly during COVID and what we have seen, we are seeing more tradesmen and craftsmen. Mm. Uh, I think this is something yes. which uh, the labour uh. movement has started, you know, uh, working with our tripartite partners to look at this space, yeah. how we can, uh, you know, really also uplift uh, this sector and attract more people. Uh, into traditional crafts, you know, we all need plumbers, we all need electricians. Yes. Uh, can we do more? Mm -hmm. I mean, we've seen the lights in uh, not just uh, in the region in Asia Pacific, in Europe, and other parts of the world where these professions are regarded very highly, yeah. and uh, they are decently and fairly, and sometimes even quite highly paid. Right. So why don't we uh, professionalize some of these sectors and to uplift, be it in gig arrangement or full time uh, work arrangements? Uh, so, so there are various actually sectors and areas and jobs which uh, we can start relooking. So, uh, like we rightly pointedly, pointedly agreed, there's no sunset uh, yeah. industries. Uh, there's only sunset companies, right? As Vikram alluded to. So, <laughs> how we, can we, you know, uplift some of these which we think are actually sunset, but actually present a lot of new opportunities mm. for all of us. Right, right. So Vikram, the progressive wage model was something that I shared with my World Economic Forum. Mm. I'm on the Global Futures Council right. for uh, jobs, wages and job creation. And they were so mm. fascinated with the model. Right. So the lift technicians, for example, yeah. if we help them with uh, elevators, we yeah. have a box that tells you when the elevator is going to break down. Mm. Then it makes them look like they are very smart too. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you create a whole new set of skills to complement the increase in wages. Right. So it's not charity, it's about mm. upskilling and right. giving people the dignity that this is a smart job. Right, right. I think one of the, uh, one of the problems with the minimum wage, I mean, which, a lot of, which has a lot of advocates, it has no productivity element. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. It has no upscaling element. It's just right. a, a one-size-fits-all right. wage. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think the, the progressive wage model, I know I've spoken to economists who have yeah. been surprised mm -hmm. at what an innovation it, mm -hmm. it is compared to the uh, old minimum wage. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I think we have come to uh, the end of our discussion. And uh, I'd like to thank, thank all of you for such a stimulating uh, panel, um, and thank you also to UOB uh, for sponsoring us, and uh, thank you viewers for listening in. Thank you, and goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>